Here are my disclosures. We do a lot of research almost with everybody that has something to do with uh, prostate cancer. And um, I'm going to start with a couple of introductory slides and then um, get into the meat of the talk. So as uh, um, of course you know, uh, prostate cancer is um, uh, a disease with a broad spectrum and we tend to think of it in terms of clinical disease states to organize our thinking about management and also about clinical trials. My talk today is going to be focused on the clinical disease states uh, on the bottom of this slide, primarily the metastatic castration resistance state. This is just a visual reminder of what we're talking about. Um, metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer is disease that's spread typically to bones. It can also, of course, spread to lymph nodes, lung and liver, um, and uh, has progressed through standard hormonal therapy. This is a typical appearance of a bone scan of one of our patients with this uh, life-threatening form of prostate cancer. So what I would like to cover today um, are uh, really three topics, and there's a lot more we could talk about, but um, that time prohibits me from digging into radiopharmaceuticals, chemotherapy, bone-directed therapy, and so many other important areas. So I'm going to focus on advances in hormonal therapy and a little bit about the scientific basis for that, and then touch, uh, touch on a recent um, clinical trial that yielded results that suggest potentially a surprising comeback for chemotherapy. But I want to start with a little bit of a historical perspective. We often start talks about hormonal therapy with an acknowledgement of uh, Hudkinson Hodges, who in the mid-1940s first described the fact that prostate cancer can be treated with hormonal manipulations. Uh, this was the one and only Nobel Prize winning research done in prostate cancer and, and really established the idea that prostate cancer is a hormonally dependent disease um, that can be treated by manipulating male hormones. For the next seven decades, we had a lot of work in this field that yielded a number of drugs that we prescribe today, but up until very recently, none of these pharmacologic methods really offered a survival advantage over standard conventional orchiectomy. They were different methods to deliver therapy, but not necessarily better outcomes for patients. But it's worth recognizing that whatever we do today um, happens on the shoulders of the work that was done before us, and so it was for Huggins and Hodges. And so I, I look back at the history of our knowledge about hormonal dependence of prostate cancer, and you can trace it back to the first um, report by John Hunter in 1786 who recognized the hormonal dependence of uh, deer and mole prostates. Uh, and from there forward, human observations were made in the 1870s and that, that finally got translated into therapies for prostate cancer in the 1940s. The progress that we've made in the last several years similarly is based on uh, the work that's been done over the last several decades. So before we dig into treatment for hormone-resistant or castration-resistant disease, a quick review of what hormonal therapy is and, and how it generally performs. Um, typically, uh, hormonal therapy today is delivered through a GnRH agonist. It's an injectable um, three- to six-month injection. We also have antagonists and also, of course, orchiectomy. On the right-hand side of the slide, you can see a graph that shows progression-free survival in metastatic disease patients treated with initial orchiectomy. This was a study of orchiectomy with and without flutamide, SWOG 8894, published in the New England Journal by Mario Eisenberger and colleagues. What you can see is that in patients with very advanced disease that involves visceral organs or the appendicular skeleton, the median time to progression on hormonal therapy is a year and a half. In more limited disease, it's closer to four years. So that's a rough estimate of what patients can expect from hormonal therapy in the metastatic setting. Now we've had um, uh, a lot of clues along the way that um, uh, we're not quite done targeting the hormonal system when we deliver frontline hormonal therapy. Uh, and that is um, uh, summarized, if you will, in this slide. So let's begin with acknowledging that the PSA test with all of its controversies in the screening arena is actually a very good marker of androgen signaling 
uh, in human beings. It's, a, it's an androgen-regulated protein. Um, we know that prostate cancer response to initial castration therapy is nearly universal, and when the disease progresses, almost always we see a rise in the serum PSA, um, suggesting that hormonal signaling is turned back on. We've known for a long time that second-line hormonal therapies do produce responses, not frequently enough and durably enough to really benefit patients substantially, but nonetheless we see responses to bicalutamide, flutamide, nilutamide, ketoconazole, uh, aminoglutethamide, and in the older era even surgical adrenalectomy as well as second-line estrogen. So there's been lots of clinical examples uh, that suggest that hormonal therapy uh, is not really complete and that there are opportunities to improve upon that. We now know that uh, newer agents, enzalutamide and abiraterone, which I'll be discussing next, uh, are more active. Uh, and even today, progression on the second, third, and fourth hormonal agent typically is associated with a rise in the PSA, suggesting that we're probably not quite done yet and there's more work to be done in targeting the hormonal signaling system. This is an example of translational data that support this notion. It's just a quick slide to remind me to tell you that when you biopsy a metastatic lesion in advanced prostate cancer in a patient who's been castrated, um, those uh, tumor samples show the expression of the androgen receptor is alive and well, uh, PSA is being manufactured, other g androgen regulated genes um, are uh, being made in response to intact androgen signaling. And in some patients, you can even find intratumoral androgen production. So the hormone signaling system is a, the major driver of, hormone, of prostate cancer progression, even on hormonal therapy. So it is with that knowledge that we've seen the emergence of two new agents, abiraterone and enzalutamide, as well as other agents in uh, still in experimental development. Uh, that um, uh, are improving upon the state of hormonal therapy in prostate cancer. I'm going to talk briefly about abiraterone, a little bit more extensively about enzalutamide. As uh, Sean mentioned, I was involved in enzalutamide development a little bit more deeply, so I just enjoy sharing that data a little bit more. But really, both of these agents have been impactful and important, and the ratio of slides is not intended to represent uh, the importance of, of the two agents. So very quickly, abiraterone is a, a very potent um, suppressor of androgen production uh, that uh, reduces hormone levels another tenfold or so beyond what conventional castration or hormonal therapy can do. So normal testosterone, say, is, is lowered from somewhere between 3 to 800 to somewhere between, let's say, 10 and 30 with luprolide acetate, and we see a drop to something like 1. Uh, with abiraterone, so a, a very potent suppressor. And Im importantly, uh, we believe it's active anywhere that androgens are made, so if they're intratumoral androgens, if they're adrenal androgens, um, uh, those sources of androgens are also uh, potentially suppressed with abiraterone. I don't know if you can see this. It looks a little fuzzy in, in my slide here on the display, but this is a, a very busy slide intended to really give you all the data about abiraterone from a randomized phase three clinical trial in men with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer where abiraterone and prednisone was compared to placebo and prednisone. And what that trial found was a significant improvement in progression-free survival and in overall survival, which didn't quite reach statistical significance, but um, you know, was very suggestive and consistent with the statistically significant overall survival benefits seen in the post-chemotherapy setting. And down below, the busy forest plots are just intended to remind us that these advantages of abiraterone were really seen across the full spectrum of patients in all subsets that were examined. I'm going to move forward to enzalutamide. I'm just looking at the time here. Um, enzalutamide, unlike um, abiraterone, um, targets the receptor. So it doesn't affect ligand or hormone levels, but it blocks um, the androgen receptor. For those who are used to the first generation androgen receptor antagonist, it's a, you could consider it a more potent bicalutamide, for example. Um, these are the results of the original phase one, two study summarized in one slide. Uh, this was a study that um, exposed um, patients with metastatic prostate cancer that's castration resistant either before 
or after chemotherapy to enzalutamide. It was um, conducted here at University of Washington at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, and um, we enrolled 140 patients. And you can see the summary data uh, in a PSA water plot. So each blue line represents one patient and the best PSA change that we observed on the study. And so you can see visually that the vast majority of patients um, had some decline in the PSA, more than half had a confirmed 50% reduction, which is our standard for response. The activity may have been a little bit less in, in the post-chemotherapy setting, but really it was active across uh, the patient groups that we studied. From those data, we designed two phase three clinical trials, one in the post-chemotherapy setting and one in the pre-chemotherapy setting. I'm going to focus here on the pre-chemotherapy PREVAIL trial. Uh, the design of the study is summarized on this slide. There were 1,700 men with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. They were randomly assigned to enzalutamide or placebo. That design was thought to be appropriate at the time because um, at the time the next treatment option is chemotherapy and we routinely uh, delay chemotherapy until there are symptoms or there is a clear indication for chemotherapy and patients could uh, take advantage of um, other therapies once they progressed um, on either placebo or enzalutamide. The co-primary endpoints uh, were overall survival and radiographic progression-free survival. We presented these data at the ASCO GU uh, meeting last uh, February and then again at ASCO and published them in the New England Journal in, in June. Um, so you can certainly access these data in, in much greater detail than I can uh, present them uh, this morning. But uh, briefly, these are the patient characteristics, median age in the early 70s, as is often the case for uh, uh, these studies. The majority of patients had uh, either no or, or very, very minimal pain. Uh, the majority were Caucasian. Median PSA was in the 50s, which is typical for pre-chemotherapy studies in metastatic disease. Importantly, uh, between 11 and 12 percent of patients had visceral uh, metastases, lung and liver, and traditionally uh, conventional thinking was that maybe these patients all just need chemotherapy. They were not included in the analogous trial of abiraterone, so this was the first phase three trial of a hormonal agent in this setting that allowed patients to participate regardless of the site of metastases. Um, in terms of drug exposure, the study was um, um, uh, terminated early when it became apparent that enzalutamide um, offered an advantage. Um, so the median uh, follow-up period for survival was 22 months, which inhibits our ability to fully estimate the, the median overall survival, which is about 10 months longer than this. Um, but here's where we were at the time of the data cutoff. The median duration of treatment on enzalutamide was 16.6 months compared to 4.6 months for placebo. That obviously reflects the activity of the drug. It's also important to remember as, uh, as we begin to look at the toxicity data because, of course, the toxicity data are collected over the treatment period, so they were collected over a three times longer period for enzalutamide than, than for placebo. At the time of the, the data cutoff, 42% of patients were still on enzalutamide therapy. 7% of patients were still on placebo therapy. This is uh, the result for radiographic progression-free survival. Uh, it was at the median 3.9 months in, in, in the placebo group. The hazard ratio was 0.18. Six indicating an 81% improvement in the risk of progression. The median hadn't been reached yet. A subsequent analyses, which um, uh, will be forthcoming in another publication, show that the median radiographic progression-free survival is somewhere between 16 and 19 months, depending on exactly which definition you apply uh, to making that call. Um, this is a... Um, force plot that didn't show up very well in translation, so take my word for it, the RPFS benefit um, accrued across all patient groups, and you can look in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, 
publication of the detail. I don't know why the, the dots disappeared. Um, this is the um, overall survival data. At the time of the data cutoff, 72% of enzalutamide patients were um, alive and 63% of placebo patients were alive. The hazard ratio was 0 0.706, indicating a 29% improvement in the risk of death. Um, because the nearly two-thirds of the patients were alive, the median estimates are very unstable at this point. This is the accounting of the post-progression therapy that these patients received. This slide focuses um, only on therapies that are known to extend life. There are a number of patients who got other investigational agents or other therapies um, that uh, have not yet or maybe never have been proven to extend survival. So and on the enzalutamide arm, 40% of patients, and on the placebo arm, 70% of patients at the time of the data cutoff had received another therapy post-progression uh, that has potential to extend survival. If you think about it, another, uh, you know, this makes uh, perfect sense in that 42% of patients on enzalutamide are still on enzalutamide. So if you add that up, you've got about 80% of patients that, have that are either still on enzalutamide or have received another therapy. And on the placebo arm, about 7% are still on placebo. So again, we're close to 80% receiving either the study drug or another life-extending therapy at the time of the data cutoff. And the distribution of these therapies are shown here. Abiraterone stands out as one that was um, uh, more commonly used in placebo-treated patients than in enzalutamide-treated patients. The um, survival benefit also accrued across all groups, um, uh, but it also doesn't show up on this graph, so you're going to have to either take my word for it or read the paper. Um, this is the updated survival analysis that the FDA requested. We haven't published this yet, but here the median follow-up was another four months. At 26 months, um, the hazard ratio continued to be similar. Uh, here, 0.73, indicating a 27% improvement. The median for placebo was 31 months, and the median for enzalutamide was not yet reached. So that's kind of where we are. When you stop a study early, it's hard to have complete data for overall survival. Nevertheless, the difference is highly statistically significant, and the statistical analysis plan is built around hazard ratios and not medians, so this is a positive result for overall survival. Um, one of the things that's of interest to patients is uh, uh, whether a treatment like this, which is oral and hormonal, can delay the need for chemotherapy, and we found that uh, chemotherapy was delayed by a median of 17 months. These are PSA response data. Here you don't see the in nice individual blue lines because we're representing 1,700 patients on one slide, so the lines blend together into a blur. Um, but you can see uh, on the enzalutamide arm, the response rate by PSA was 78%, um, and there is a small slither of patients with the green color going up that did not respond and progressed uh, right from the beginning and we see the opposite result in placebo. There is a small percentage of patients, 3.5% that responded to placebo. We don't at this point know why that is, whether there are some patients in whom PSA fluctuates wildly, whether they also took a steroid or took some other product that the investigators didn't know about. Um, but um, it is a, a small percentage that will be interesting to take a look at. Uh, time to PSA progression uh, at the 12-month at the mark, 48% uh, of patients were free of PSA progression on enzalutamide, 7% on, on placebo, as you'd expect. Uh, one of the, the notable findings of this trial was the activity in um, soft tissue measurable disease. As you may recall, for chemotherapy, the measurable disease response rate is somewhere in the 10 to 20% range, depending on which trial you look at. Here we saw a 58.8% uh, objective response rate in patients who had either visceral or nodal measurable disease, and uh, that broke down into 20% complete response rate and about a 40% partial response rate. So a significant level of activity vindicating our decision to um, invite patients with visceral metastases into this trial. Um, treatment was also associated with a delay in skeletal-related events. 
um, as shown on this Kaplan-Meier curve. And I'm not going to have time to get into the details of quality of life. A presentation of the quality of life data and, a, and an associated publication is, is forthcoming. But um, suffice it to say that treatment was, was associated with a delay and deterioration uh, of quality of life and a more frequent improvement in quality of life on enzalutamide than on placebo. This is a very busy slide. Uh, that shows you the most common adverse events. Uh, in this particular cut, we looked at all grades uh, and grade three and higher events, and we included uh, events that, were, uh, that occurred in at least 10% of patients and were at least 2% different between the two arms. And um, fatigue, back pain, arthralgias, um, hot flashes um, stand out. Some of these adverse events, um, when you correct them for the duration of observation, um, don't turn out to be really different between the two arms, but some clearly are, and th those would be things like fatigue and hypertension. Um, this is a specific review of adverse effects of uh, special interest, either because they've been identified previously uh, or because uh, they're common with other agents in the field. So for hypertension, uh, it does not wash out with corrections for time of observation. It is a real um, adverse effect of enzalutamide, and you can see 13% versus 4% for any grade and 7 versus 2 for grade 3 or higher. Um, the uh, cardiac events are shown here. The most common cardiac event was atrial fibrillation. Uh, thankfully, liver function abnormalities were relatively uncommon, and seizures were seen in two patients, one in the placebo arm and one in the enzalutamide arm, which was reassuring given that seizures were one of the safety signals at, uh, from the previous trials. And I'm going to move forward because I'm running out of time. So what we concluded from the PREVAIL trial is that treatment with enzalutamide reduced the risk of death, delayed progression of metastatic disease. Um, delayed the need for uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy and delayed deterioration of quality of life and uh, skeletal related complications of, of cancer. Um, the next three slides put side by side uh, Prevail and Cougar 302, which are the two trials that studied these um, new hormonal drugs in the pre chemotherapy castration resistant setting. Just to be completely clear, I'm not uh, drawing conclusions as to which trial was superior to another, but for a practitioner who's forced to choose between two drugs with the same indication, it's just worth seeing what the differences may have been. So uh, in this slide, um, we look at the differences in trial design. So Prevail compared um, enzalutamide to placebo, Cougar 302 compared its drug against prednisone. That's going to be important in interpreting the efficacy data. It's a little harder to beat prednisone than it is to beat placebo, which is like shooting fish in a barrel. So I wouldn't compare the, for example, the hazard ratios from one trial to the other and conclude that enzalutamide was better because I don't think you can really say that across trials given the design and given the fact that there was not a direct comparison. Visceral disease was allowed on Prevail, was not allowed on Cougar 302. The cardiac exclusions were a little bit more um, uh, liberal and prevail than they were on Cougar 302. Um, there were some differences in how the uh, conduct of the trial was designed. So for example, in prevail, we allowed patients to continue the study drug past progression if the clinician and the patient were interested in doing that and interesting, interested in not starting another therapy. There are occasionally patients that, as you know, progress very slowly and the judgment of their clinicians are still maybe benefiting from therapy, don't want chemotherapy, yet on Prevail they could if they wanted to continue the study drug. They didn't have to, of course. We also allowed other indicated therapies during Prevail, like CYP-T, systemic radiopharmaceuticals, which were not allowed in Cougar 302. So these are subtle differences between the, the studies. Patients with a history of seizures were excluded from Prevail. Uh, they were not excluded from Cougar 302. The studies really um, uh, attracted very similar patient populations. You can see here age, a median time from diagnosis, PSA data, 
um, LDH data and so forth, there really wasn't any discernible uh, difference uh, between the, the principal characteristics of the patients in these trials. Um, the major difference was the inclusion of visceral disease in, in prevail. And then these are the efficacy results. They're just put up side by side for your convenience. Again, you can't really compare these to one another fairly. They're not, the two drugs were not studied against each other. And not only that, they were uh, not studied against the same control arm. So in um, the chemotherapy naive setting, um, abiraterone is currently FDA approved, both pre and post chemotherapy. And enzalutamide, at the time that I was required to turn these slides in for review by the CME committee, was not yet approved, but now is. That transpired several days ago. So both drugs are approved pre and post chemo. Um, I'm going to skip the next few slides because I'm looking at my time. Um, the next few slides very briefly review the results of the post chemotherapy trials of abiraterone and enzalutamide. And, um, they were uh, both positive. They're both published in the New England Journal and readily accessible. We've got about 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Yep. I can have extra time? Yep. Can All have right. Time. We're early. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. Well, then I will. You know, these, my goodness. I think we back translated these slides from a PDF and something got lost in translation okay. here. So, um, this blank slide shows you that abiraterone increased survival in metastatic prostate cancer after chemotherapy. And um, you can barely see the progression-free survival results. And for whatever reason, the overall survival results are missing. So I apologize for that. Um, and here are the principal results of the analogous AFFIRM trial with uh, enzalutamide uh, post-chemotherapy, which yielded a survival advantage with a hazard ratio of 0.63. PSA, radiographic, PSA and radiographic progression-free survival with hazard ratios of 0.25 and 0.40. Um, since we have a little time, it's, it's interesting scientifically and clinically to look at these results and think about them a little bit. Uh, for the measures that um, directly evaluate a drug effect, radiographic progression-free survival and PSA progression-free survival, the PREVAIL trial actually looks a little bit better than the AFFIRM trial. The hazard ratios are better. So when you use um, PREVAIL in that setting, you, you, there's a bigger effect when compared to placebo on progression-free survival. There's a higher PSA response rate. All those things look better. But the hazard ratio for overall survival looks better post-chemo. And um, my, uh, my hypothesis about that is that it is much harder to demonstrate an overall survival benefit when you test the drug early and patients live a long time and can have five other therapies that extend survival post-progression. So um, that's how I would look uh, at those data as the person that was involved in both of these trials. So as I mentioned already, both abiraterone and enzalutamide have been shown to improve progression-free survival, improve overall survival, and are approved for use in the post-chemotherapy setting. Um, so where are we going in this field? We have two new agents, um, several others in clinical trials. Uh, and you know, in oncology, uh, this is really um, both significant progress for patients, but also really just the beginning. Um, when you think about how we use drugs in other diseases, it often takes a decade or so to really figure out what is the, the best place and the best strategy for drugs. So we have a lot of questions that now need to be answered. Can we sequence these drugs? Can we combine them with each other, with other drugs? Does that make any um, difference for patients? Uh, where is the best place for each of these drugs, uh, pre-chemo, post-chemo? What are the mechanisms of resistance? And can we learn from those mechanisms to make the therapies more effective by interdicting those mechanisms? So there's a lot of work going on uh, to build on these positive results with Cougar 301 and 302 and prevail and affirm clinical trials. So the landscape for, for prostate cancer therapy, and I don't have the time to talk about all these things, has really been evolving um, uh, quite dramatically. I got involved in this disease in 1997 where the best a medical oncologist could do was mitoxantrone and prednisone, uh, a modestly effective palliative chemotherapy with no survival advantage. In 05, we had the first life-extending chemotherapy in docetaxel. Uh, 
Um, by 2011, we had four uh, agents, and now we have six agents that in, in randomized um, cl uh, clinical trials have produced level one evidence of an overall survival advantage in prostate cancer. In addition to the um, strategies about combining uh, sequencing and understanding the mechanisms of activity, um, what else is going on in the field is a lot of other additional new agents, immunotherapeutics, anti-angiogenesis agents, molecularly targeted agents. Um, XL184 is probably not going to make it. This slide was reviewed before the uh, negative results of those trials were reported. So that's kind of an attempt to summarize scientifically what is going on in the clinical research arena for advanced prostate cancer in the context of these new drugs. So very briefly at ASCO there was a, a plenary presentation um, from prostate cancer and it was not on any one of these new drugs. It was on old-fashioned chemotherapy which was really a big surprise uh, for many of us. Chris Sweeney did a beautiful job presenting the results of the charted study. Um, this is a pretty busy slide that's a little bit cut off that shows you the design of the charted study. Um, and basically, um, what this study did is it took patients with newly metastatic prostate cancer that were not on any therapy. Um, so nowadays, we often start hormonal therapy for rightly or wrongly for a rising PSA and also maybe for adjuvant disease. And so by the time folks develop metastases, they're often castration resistant already. Um, so this isn't what most patients look like today. But there are still those patients who are metastatic at diagnosis. Th these were the patients that were studied here. All the patients started on standard hormonal therapy. Uh, and they were randomized to six cycles of docetaxel without prednisone or uh, just standard hormonal therapy. And there was a striking result for overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0.61, indicating a 39% reduction in the risk of death, and at the median, uh, a, a pretty dramatic difference of 14 months, uh, 44 months versus almost 58 months. And when you think about the effect of the same agent, docetaxel, given for 10 doses in metastatic castration-resistant disease, where the hazard ratio in favor of the drug is 0.8, and the median difference in survival is two and a half months. Uh, and so you have to deliver six months of therapy to two and a half months of survival. Now, it's not a totally fair comparison, because obviously individual patients can benefit a lot more or a lot less. But on the whole, it's you know, kind of a marginal um, drug at a population level. Here you deliver um, six doses, uh, so 18 weeks of therapy. And apparently, there is an overall survival advantage um, of nearly 14 months. So this is a, a result that ASCO deemed to be worthy of a plenary presentation and the NCI deemed worthy of a press release as a potentially practice changing finding. Uh, the um, effect was most clear in uh, patients with high volume disease, those of four or more bone lesions or visceral metastases. The subset that had low volume disease or limited metastases the hazard ratio was actually very similar, but the numbers of patients were so small that it's harder to be sure about that. This is a, a forest plot that showed the um, effects by different uh, uh, subsets of the population. And again, chemotherapy was consistently favored, so the result was not a, uh, some sort of an aberration in some unusually chemotherapy-sensitive subset of patients. <clears throat> so. Um, you know, in conclusion from my entire talk, um, I think what we learned this year is that uh, the, the pre versus post chemotherapy distinction in castration resistant prostate cancer is really an artificial regulatory distinction and not a biologic distinction, at least as it relates to androgen receptor targeting and androgen ligand inhibiting agents, which produce uh, favorable results before and after chemotherapy. Um, AR-targeted therapies are generally moving in front of chemotherapy because of um, apparent, readily apparent toxicity advantages and, and probably a higher level of activity as well, even though, to be fair, nobody's compared them directly to chemotherapy. And in this triumphant moment for hormonal agents, chemotherapy has made a leap ahead 
into the very front line along with standard hormonal therapy, which nobody expected, but we're actually incorporating into our practice given the, the unambiguous results of the charted trial. So that's it for my talk. Thank you so much for giving me the extra time.